Yeah, I've always felt my, my views on animals are are not the norm. They don't fit squarely in the middle or the average. Uh, I think back to my childhood and I would feel quite alienated from little kids who squashed insects under their feet. In fact, I felt felt they were more alien to me far, by far than the little creature they were they were killing. And um and I think a lot of that is, you know, it's learned behavior, it's culture. They probably learned that from their parents who maybe uh, didn't like insects and were vocal about that and, and harmed them or or poisoned them or what, whatever. And so so much of it is what we learned from our adults. If they'd seen their parents uh, care about them or remove them and take them outside and treat them compassionately, then I think they'd, they'd pick up on that behavior. So we're kind of products of our, of our upbringing. So... Um, you know, that's important to keep that in mind. It, you know, I often wonder, you know, what what would my attitudes to animals be like if I was raised in a family that exploited and abused animals all the time? I wasn't. My family was very interested and respectful of life. So although I do think that I, I was born with a gene for caring about animals, I just feel like that's very intrinsic to who I am. And I think anyone today who's 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 vegan probably feels like an outlier. They don't feel like they're wrong. They feel very, I mean, vegans tend to be righteous internally, hopefully not too righteous externally, but but we, we, we know we're making the right decision by not consuming animal products. But but you're not, we're not exactly, it's the center. We're not exactly typical in that way. So I think um, those who really care about animals do kind of carry that that um, awareness that they're not completely fitting in. And it's, but it's not a case of uh, how, how shall I fit in better? It's like, when are they going to catch up to me? Yeah, there's so many to, to try to cho choose among, but one that sticks out to me is a, is a study that was done by researchers at the University of Lisbon. That, that's just happenstance, could be anywhere, but they actually did a study whose conclusion is essentially, I can if I can really condense it, the conclusion is that Fishes uh, who are caressed, well, they will seek caresses to relieve stress. So they stress these fishes. They caught these striated surgeon fishes, about 32 of them from the Great Barrier Reef. They That being caught and taken out of your home is pretty stressful to begin with. And you can measure that by taking a little blood sample and measuring cortisol, a stress hormone. And it was very high levels. And then they stressed them more. By the way, just, just a disclaimer here. I don't necessarily endorse these studies because I described them. But the fact that they've been done... Uh, if that information can change attitudes about these creatures, then I, I will use that information unabashedly. Uh, so they stressed them further by taking each fish and putting them in for half an hour in a very shallow bucket of water. That That's extremely got to be very stressful, just as it would be for us um, in, a, in an analogous situation. And so they once again, they can measure the stress. They're very stressed. And then they gave them, they divided them into two groups and uh, each fish was put into a tank of water individually uh, with plenty of water this time with a model of a, of a, of a cleaner wrasse, a blue striped cleaner wrasse, very realistic model. This is a fish that does cleaning services on reefs. That's a whole other uh, symbiosis that's fascinating among fish and, and their social behavior and their cognitive behavior. And sometimes the little wrasses will actually caress, will actually flutter their pectoral fins against the uh, the skin of the of the so-called client fish to probably to, to make them feel good about the treatment they're getting and want to come back because it's a livelihood. It's a business relationship between these fish. So what they did in this study, the, the, this, this model fish was either one or two conditions. It was either just stationary so it didn't move or it was hooked up to a motor that caused it to go in a sweeping motion back and forth so it could deliver caresses. And the stressed surgeon fishes in, this, in that second, in, that, in the one where it was a moving model, would swim up to it and get caressed. And they, they, after an hour, they, they, ca they counted how many times it did this, about 15 times an hour. They'd spend several seconds or maybe half a minute up against this model getting caressed. And their stress levels came markedly down, dropped r uh, rapidly in that condition. And the ones in the stationary where there was no movement and therefore no opportunity to receive caresses, they made zero movement, zero uh, contacts per hour. I mean, a striking difference, 15 times an hour, almost addictive behavior, and zero times an hour. And needless to say, that second group, their stress levels did not drop. So to me, that is a mind-blowing study, a mind-blowing uh, finding that totally blows out of the water, so to speak, the, the old assumptions we have about fishes as, as you know, cold-blooded, unfeeling, unthinking creatures. Uh, there's so many 
um, ramifications to that one study. I'm happy to say that at the end of the study, the, all of the surgeon fishes survived the study and the, the researchers returned them to their initial uh, homes on the reef. Um, and they report that in the paper. That the, I was very pleased to see that. That's unfortunately that's still atypical. It's becoming more common for scientists to report the final disposition of the animals in their studies, uh, but it's still not typical. So I, I think it's an important part of the paper to, to not only do that but to report it. So we can summarize that by just basically saying a very in sort of human terms, uh, we know a massage feels good to us and, and can de-stress us, and and the same basically the same thing occurs for fishes. Yeah, I should add I should add that uh, keeping a goldfish in a goldfish bowl is 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 illegal, uh, technically illegal in some parts of Europe. I think the city of Rome some time ago, Switzerland. And the Netherlands may also have similar laws like that, that uh, as it should be. I mean, these are social animals. A goldfish can live 40 years. Uh, they, they form social relationships. They're renowned for helping others in distress, other goldfish who, who are they're probably their friends in an aquarium situation. And this kind of thing probably happens in the wild as well. Um, so there's, and they, they, they like places to hide and a, the barren goldfish bowl, which has become kind of a, a meme, hasn't it? You see it in advertising and this sort of thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's a terrible, terrible fate and plight for, for that fish who's probably not going to live very long and who knows whether they can die of depression or not. Uh, it wouldn't totally surprise me, but they certainly are probably miserable in that setting. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of problems with the whole aquarium fish industry, and and if I, if I could snap my fingers and that and that whole dimension about our relationship with fishes went away, uh, keeping them in aquaria, I, I would, uh, just because of the 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 terrible mortality rates, the 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 harmful methods by which the the fishes are caught and transported, uh, inhumane and harmful, and the death rates are very very high. Uh, so having said that, that's not to say, however, that there aren't some salubrious aspects of the of the relationships that humans may have with their aquarium fish. I think s s many aquarists probably just feel proud to have them in there and they like to look at them and that's it. But there are many who form relationships with their fishes and I describe some of those in my book, What a Fish Knows. Uh, Long-term, multi-year relationships, a decade or longer where these animals have names and they greet, they greet them when the, the, the human comes home and the fish swims to the tank to greet the human and they may play games and, and one person actually put her hands would, would cup her hands and put them in the water and her her blue um can't quite remember the name of the name of the speed discus her blue discus fish uh, jasper would would swim into her hand lie on his his or her side i guess his if it's jasper and uh, she would stroke him with her thumbs and this became sort of part of their connection and needless to say, you know, she was very, very saddened when he died after six years or so, however many years it was. I mean, people, we form these connections with, with these creatures. So um, that certainly, that type of relationship can enhance our respect for and relations with fishes. But unfortunately, it also happens in, as part of, a, of an exploitive, harmful industry to fishes. So there's a bit of an irony in there. It's it's hard to say. Ironically, you know, I want to say if they learn all the facts about them, they have emotions and and they think and they have social lives, etc. Uh, and I think that's valuable. But uh, time and again, we hear that uh, facts don't actually get people to change their minds in, anywhere nearly as much as feelings do. If you can touch them here, if you can engage their emotions, which stories, unlike facts, back to anecdotes, really stories can touch uh, and i've learned as a science writer that that I, it's important to include stories personal experiences but also those of others so um i think stories if people read about what fishes are capable of doing in a story like touching context uh might be effective ironically ironically it's it's often thought you know we need to get people to change attitudes and then they'll stop eating them 
flip it flip it around the other way the biggest barrier to them changing may be that they're eating eating them so if people stopped eating them they no longer have this need to defend the behavior and they no longer have the need this need to keep fishes at a distance to alienate from them that's a very powerful you know cognitive dissonance kind of effect and so but of course getting people to stop eating something that they've eaten all their life and they and they consider it benign to do so or, or they think it's acceptable or they're not willing to give up the taste all those reasons we hear it's very hard to do to get someone to give up uh, something that they that is part of their their life um, every week and and they may have that common perception that they won't be able to replace that even though as i often say in my talks about fishes there's more and more products that are coming out the rise of plant-based uh, meats and the rise of, of, of cell cultured lab grown clean meat whatever you want to call it I mean these are these are these could be game changers ahead but uh, getting people to stop eating them of course is the most important thing that we, that we can do in terms of improving our relations with fishes ultimately yeah the way we the language we use is is i think really important in how we may convey messages about animals and how we may view them and our attitudes towards them and it was quite early on in the process of researching and writing what a fish knows that i i decided to advocate for calling them fishes instead of fish the collective fish now let me just say that the word fishes is, is a legitimate word in the english language and it's it's more formal use is as i learned what is to refer to more than one species of fish uh, so you know, books uh, books about fishes, academic books and textbooks and such, almost you always use the word fishes, not fish. So that word is very legitimate. It's just not usually used for individuals, and I kind of made the case we should use it for individuals. Um, so, I, I, you know, and it's a bit of a risk to do that because one might be coming across as a bit dogmatic or maybe I should say fishmatic um, about, about how, how we use language and how we name things. And so I actually got an email once from Peter Singer, maybe three, four years ago, saying, I, I know you advocated for fishes, but it's a bit awkward and it makes us sound a bit uh, dogmatic or something to that effect. And I, 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 I somewhat relented. I, I said, I, I hear you. I, I see what you're saying. And, and I've encountered that, too. And I, and I obviously I'd say it's a judgment call, depending on the audience and the context, uh, what we what we call them. If we if we are to say fishes in a, in a context that might seem a little awkward, probably we need to go to the trouble of explaining why we think that might be a better way to, to call to call them. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can get in a, in a little tight, tight in knots, it can get a little bit awkward when you, if you, if you were to say salmons and tunas and, uh, I've seen those words in the plural, but it's, it's not typical, but isn't it interesting that we use the singular and it kind of just sort of homogenizes them all. Oh, they're all the same. They're all fish. And they aren't. They're, they're totally unique. Uh, this, each species is different and every individual within the species. So, so it's, if nothing else. Being dogmatic and saying fishes gets people talking about things that are, are worth talking about. Yeah, Superfly, for those who may not know, is an exploration of the lives of a group of insects that are, deserve some, some press and some attention. The flies, the true, the true flies, the diptera, so named because they have two wings uh, and not the usual four among insects, flying insects. So they're diverse, they're incredibly successful, probably the most successful group of insects on Earth. And insects already are far and away the most successful of the macroorganisms, the ones that we can see, not counting microorganisms, but, but, but insects, 80% of all animal species on Earth is an insect. So uh, that, that alone, that statistic alone, uh, says supports what I just said before. Um, and flies are arguably, and it's becoming more and more thought to be the case, that they are the most diverse group within the insects. Beetles have been the leaders for, for decades, uh, but new, new discoveries of new species of beetles are, are much slower paced than new discoveries of new species of flies. And it's thought that, that uh, going from 160-odd thousand described species that we know now, there, there may be five times that many in the in the world. When people go, uh, entomologists go into the tropics and sample uh, insects in their traps and they look at them, most of them are undescribed and certainly most of the flies have never been seen before. So there's a sobering subtext to that, of course, and that is that as we destroy rainforest habitat and rock tropical habitats, we're probably losing many, many species every day. Uh, because some of these flies are very specialized and may have very small ranges. So we're losing species before we even know they're there. 
So anyway, diversity and success is one of the reasons why I wanted to write about them. Uh, we all have experiences with flies. Uh, mosquitoes are flies. So very few people has, have not, you know, and, and, unless you've stayed cloistered in your home all your life. And even then, you probably had an experience with a mosquito. They're omnipresent. There's several thousand species, most of which don't bite humans, but uh, there's enough of them that bite us to get our attention. And of course, in, in once again, in tropical areas, they can harbor very dangerous diseases. Mosquitoes are credited with being uh, killing more humans throughout history than humans have, which is the only species that ranks or any group of animals that ranks above us for killing ours, our, our own species. So that's a pretty sobering fact. But uh, of course, I didn't write the book to demonize insects or mosquitoes. We we need them. We we need flies. We need we need insects because they are they they you know, eighty percent of all animal species. They're running the planet. We think we are, but we're much more vulnerable than small creatures who can have twenty five generations in one year. Uh, they're much more evolutionarily nimble. Uh, you know, a million years after the last human treads the earth, there'll be a fly preening her wings somewhere on a, on a leaf, hopefully on a leaf. And uh, so we shouldn't be too big for our boots when it comes to insects. Um, uh, we only think we're we're running the show here, but actually the insects are. So and that, that's another reason why I wanted to write about them is, is to to make people aware that we need them. Uh, and, and insect declines are, are disturbing, as with fish declines. Estimated about half of all insects have disappeared from the planet in the last 50 years. And uh, they're ranked second only to the bees and wasps for pollination services. Um, pollination of plants, of course, is the food that we eat. And, and even people who eat meat, uh, the animals that they eat are herbivores. They need plants to feed themselves. So everybody ultimately relies on plants for our food supply. Mm -hmm.